Now we're dealing with color. And when we deal with art, oftentimes we look at color a little bit differently. And a lot of the ideas that we see here will also stop you from painting your house the wrong color should you ever buy one. First of all, in art, color is technically referred to as hue. And it's simply the wavelength of light creating a specific color. So this is generally what we mean when we say color. We, we're referring specifically to the hue, this wavelength of light. And there's different forms of color and different interactions of color. We have, for example, primary and secondary colors. The primary colors are, of course, red, blue, yellow. The secondary colors, orange, violet, and green. And of course, you didn't hear me say purple because purple's not a color. Violet is a color. Look at your Crayola crayon box. Either way, when we look at it, you would never want to use primary colors to decorate. It would be horrible. You would be looking at a daycare or a McDonald's. Nor would you want to use secondary colors because you'd be at Mardi Gras. But we tend to use colors that are close to each other, that are called analogous. If you find, say, three colors that are next to each other in the color wheel, they will always go together. But we do use primary and secondary colors quite often for something else. Oftentimes, you'll find colors that are across from each other on the color wheel. These are known as complementary or contrasting colors. And here we see yellow on violet and violet on yellow. And you notice those colors stand out. We tend to use those color combinations, not so much in art, although if I'm trying to create a gray or I'm trying to dull a color down, I will always add its complement. But we tend to see this used for sports teams or holidays. Think about it. Uh, we have blue and orange. You're probably thinking of the Bears. I'm thinking of the Denver Broncos because this is Wisconsin. We have red and green, Christmas. We have uh, violet and yellow, which is another team that won't be talked about right now. These may be the colors that you use for your high school. And the reason we do that is because with these colors, if I put two complementary colors together, it will always catch your attention. That's why we use it in corporate logos so often. These bright primary colors, often complementary colors. Now, you'll also notice when you look over to the right side, we see that orange and red are not complementary. These are not bright. These do not stand out the same way that our blue and yellow do. Again, that's complementary versus analogous. Don't worry too much about analogous colors, although you'll often see artists using uh, a group of colors, a group of analogous colors. We also have what are referred to as warm and cool tones. And when you're looking at a painting, oftentimes one of the things you want to note is, is the palette warm or cool, the colors that the artist is choosing. Warm tones are basically red, orange, yellow. Cold tones are green, blue, violet. And they give you that sense of either warmth or cold. It's also useful if you happen to be an artist to know that at least for the human face or pretty much anything you depict, if you have warm colors for your highlights, you want cold colors for your shadows because it's going to increase that contrast and increase the three-dimensionality of whatever you happen to be drawing or painting. Then we have value. Now value is how light or dark a color is. For example, yellow is a very light value and violet is very dark. And this becomes important because when we look at a painting, we want to find a good mix. We want, for example, uh, a little bit of highlight, a little bit of very bright color, and a little bit of very dark and a lot in between, or maybe we want a lot of very light and a lot of very dark and almost nothing in between. They would give you a different emotional response when you look at them. And the best way to think of value, in fact, if you're looking at a painting and you're trying to interpret it, take out your phone, take a picture of it, go to Insta Snap a Chatogram, and put on the black and white filter. 
and it will give you immediately the value of the piece. In this case, this is a very middle value piece. You can see from sort of the middle neutral grays that are so prominent throughout it. Then we have intensity. Intensity is the saturation of hue within the color. In other words, how intense is that color? And with an example like this, you'll notice we have a great deal of intensity, for example, here with my violet and my orange on either side. But as I start to move across this spectrum, we have very low intensity here. We have grays and browns primarily. So intensity is how bright that color is. Oftentimes in paintings, we try not to have too much intensity unless you're getting into graphics or something a little bit more modern since most of the world doesn't exist on the very intense ends of the spectrum. Then we have the artist palette. Now this doesn't simply exist to hide the fact that Bob Ross is missing part of his finger, but instead, the artist palette refers to the colors that an artist will commonly use with most of their work. Artists are like anyone else. Look at your closet. Go ahead, get up, go take a look at it. You'll probably find that most of your clothes fall into a certain range of color. Maybe you have a lot of blues, greens, reds, etc. And maybe that's a very subdued tone. That would be your palette. That's your personal palette, your personal favorite colors. Well, artists do the same thing. They tend to use the same mixes and the same colors. This is a great way to identify an artist, but that palette can also give us a sense of mood and emotion. For example, if, a, if an artist is working in a very blue palette, it might give us a sense of calm or depression. Whereas if they work in a very yellow palette, it might give us a sense of happiness or energy. Finally, we have mass. And mass is the apparent volume within the two-dimensional space. Basically, how realistically three-dimensional does something in a painting or drawing look? And there are three ways that people do this. This is a drawing by Degas that we're looking at, which shows all three. First of all, you will see the use of light and shadow as we see here in the arm. By using light on top, blending it a little bit to a darker shadow underneath, we get that sense of a cylinder, that that arm rounds over, that it's not just a flat shape. So light and shadow is used quite commonly. Next, we would see the use of perspective, which we don't see here very much, but that's where generally you would have a vanishing point and then you have our implied lines working out from it, telling you that there is some depth to the image. Finally, you can use texture. And these bushes are a great example of this. So the bushes, if I just drew sort of a green form, is going to look like some kind of green glob sitting on the landscape. It's not going to make a lot of sense. But here he uses darks, lays down that dark tone first, and then works towards the lights with smaller and smaller marks as he moves forward in space to give us that sense of depth and mass, that sense that I can put my hand into that bush and there's going to be some depth there.